Good day. My name is Robert Inklaar and today I am going to give a short explainer about growth accounting. The idea of growth accounting is to give us an idea whether economic growth will continue in the future uh, and to give us a better understanding why economic growth is uh, as high or as low as it is. Um, so if we're basically asking whether countries will continue to grow, like fast-growing countries such as Japan or Korea or currently like China or India, uh, we're basically asking about the drivers of economic growth. And to make life a little easier, we can distinguish between uh, whether uh, growth is due to more inputs or whether growth is due to the more productive use of those inputs whether it's due to extensive or intensive growth. If we want to know this, uh, we should look at, a, at the production function because that tells us the link between outputs, inputs and productivity. Um, so in this, in this setup, we have uh, uh, on the horizontal axis capital per worker and output per worker on the vertical axis. The standard production functions that we consider uh, ha all have uh, a shape as drawn here. Uh, and so the, uh, so the equation is given uh, that output Y is a function of productivity A and capital per worker K. Um, the important feature here is that there are so-called diminishing marginal returns to capital. And this closely follows the, the modeling by, by Solo in the 50s, and, uh, and that's been done so far. Um, what is shown in this, uh, in this example uh, is uh, so-called extensive growth. So what we see here is that there's two points denoted, one uh, at K0 and one point at K1. Um, so in this economy, there's been an increase in the amount of capital. And as a result, uh, there's a movement along the production function. There's a an, an upward movement in output per worker from Y0 to Y1. Um, the diminishing marginal returns are shown here as the, the curvature of this production function. So uh, an, a doubling of, the, of capital per worker will... Uh, will lead to ever smaller increases in, uh, in output. Um, uh, so the, uh, so the, the idea here is that if growth, uh, if, if inputs continue to grow, that will lead to subsequently smaller increases in output. And as a result, such input driven, such extensive growth will stagnate in the long run. An alternative uh, is intensive growth, uh, displayed here by a shift of the production function. So there's a movement from uh, the, the blue uh, production function uh, with productivity level A1 to the red production function with productivity level A2. Um, that upward shift uh, leads to an increase in uh, uh, in output from y, from y0 to y1. And if you would then also have an increase in capital per worker, uh, you'd have a further increase to y2. Um, yeah, but the shift from the blue to the red curve is so-called disembodied technological change. Um, there's an improvement in, uh, in outputs without any increases in inputs. Uh, and in... Uh, unless you have a very clear idea on why that is going on, this is in principle not bounded. Eh? So where extensive growth uh, will, will lead to diminishing marginal returns and to ever smaller increments to output, uh, this disembodied technological change, these shifts of the production function can continue in principle indefinitely. So... Deciding between extensive and intensive growth, how much of the improvements in outputs are due to improvements in inputs and how much due to productivity, 
that is the key question that growth accounting uh, aims to resolve. Um, as, so as shown here, the question is really, uh, if we observe two points for capital, K0 and K1, and if we observe two points for outputs, Y0 and Y1, um, is this uh, is this a growth that is purely extensive? Is it purely because uh, the, that there's only been an increase in capital uh, and thus an increase in, in output per worker? Or has there actually been an improvement in productivity as well? So we shift uh, from the, the bottom right uh, production function to the top pro uh, red production function. So growth accounting aims to answer this question. Um, so let me run this uh, equation down for you. Um, the, the starting point here is that we assume a Cobb-Douglas production function uh, where output Y is a function of productivity A, capital uh, K uh, and labor L. And uh, capital K is, given, is taken to the exponent alpha, labor L is taken to the exponent beta. Um, so that means that alpha and beta are the output elasticities uh, with respect to uh, these factor inputs. Now, if we start from this Cobb-Douglas production function, we can write this uh, equation in uh, log growth terms uh, and decompose growth in GDP on the left-hand side into growth due to factor inputs. Uh, so the contribution of capital is the growth of capital times the output elasticity. The contribution of labor is the growth of labor times the output elasticity of labor. And the remainder, the residual, is then productivity. Uh, so if we think about well, what is, what is behind these factors, and that also tells us why this is an, an, a useful exercise, is because it can help us understand how different underlying factors influence the growth process. So if we're interested in labor growth, uh, if we see labor growth being an important factor, uh, then that tells us that probably population growth or improvements in labor force participation or improvements in, in schooling are important factors. If we're looking at capital, then it's about savings, investments, depreciation, and the type of assets that are being uh, being installed. And if we then, if we finally attribute growth to productivity, then uh, this is the improvements in the efficiency with which capital and labor are being used, uh, and that too tells us something about uh, the growth process, uh, whether there's been innovation, whether there's been imitation of, uh, of technologies at, uh, at, from richer countries, or perhaps whether there's been an, a reallocation of resources to more productive firms and industries. So this, um, this growth accounting decomposition, as shown in the equation, um, requires uh, data on growth of output and inputs so that we can back out the growth of productivity. Uh, the growth of output that is not due to inputs. Um, but we still have two important parameters that are not measured here, alpha and beta. Uh, recall that these are the elasticities of output with respect to capital and labor. So in, uh, in this literature, there's basically two approaches. Um, you can estimate alpha and beta, uh, and so the econometric approach, or you can derive it based on uh, economic theory, the so-called index number approach. Uh, under this index number approach, uh, we typically need to make two assumptions. The first of these is that uh, is the assumption of constant returns to scale. Uh, so in technical terms, that means that alpha plus beta equals to one. Uh, intuitively, this means that if all inputs increase by 1%, then output is also uh, rising by 1%. Uh, and if there's an increasing returns to scale, then output would increase by more than 1%. So that is the first assumption. 
The second assumption is uh, perfect competition. Um, and perfect competition in the market for production factors, for labor and capital, and perfect competition in the market for outputs. Um, and in this, if under that, that perfect competition assumption, we can ob actually observe this elasticity of output because uh, firms will hire workers and will install capital up to the point where the marginal product of capital and labor is equal to the marginal cost. And we can actually observe marginal cost. We, can, we know the wages of workers. We can infer the rental price of capital. So uh, we can then approximate this output elasticity by the, by the revenue share. Uh, so as shown at the bottom row, the beta is then measured as labor income as a share of GDP. And alpha, the output elasticity of capital, is 1 minus beta. So the big advantage of this index number approach is that, uh, that we don't need, that we can observe all these factors and, uh, and then implement the growth accounting exercise. Of course, that comes at the cost of making these assumptions, and that's not ideal. Uh, at the same time, econometric estimation also uh, involves uh, uh, a load of assumptions. So there's no uh, guaranteed way in which one of these will give you more reliable or more useful answers. So let me give you a, uh, a concrete example uh, to illustrate this, uh, this method. And to do that, I am drawing on the Penworld table, uh, a database of outputs and inputs in an international context. So if you want to uh, check this for yourself, I've also added the PWT, the Penworld table variable uh, uh, acronyms uh, so that you can uh, compare uh, the numbers that I've put up here with, uh, well, those for your own country uh, or other periods. So I'm looking here at China for the period 2000 to 2019, relying on Pen World Table version 10.0. Um, so what are shown is uh, our uh, output GDP, uh, labor inputs, uh, employment, average hours worked, and human capital, and produce capital, so buildings, machinery, etc. Uh, and those are the inputs. And then we have the share of labor income in GDP on the bottom row. Uh, also shown is the log growth rate. So that's the, the, the natural log of the 2019 value divided by the 2000 value. And that gives you the, the, the log growth rate. Uh, the, the delta log uh, from the equation here at the top. So, um, well, these are the, the overall growth rates over this full period for output and inputs. Um, this, the next step is to go from, uh, is to go to a GDP per worker uh, and inputs per worker perspective, because that corresponds to the, the figure we showed. It's you can also do it without that transformation, but this, uh, uh, well, this, this is uh, for, for better matching there. Um, so you can see that, uh, well, we have a 19 year period. So the total growth of GDP of 124% translates to a 6.5% average annual growth. Um, the average annual growth of GDP is thus 6.5%. The growth of employment is 0.4%, so GDP per worker has increased by 6.1%, the difference between these two. Now, if we follow that logic and we look at not just GDP per worker, uh, so the, the second column here, the 6.1%, but also growth of, uh, of human capital, so hours worked and schooling, uh, the growth of produced capital. Uh, and so that's the top row. So we see that GDP grew by 6.1% on average, human capital by 1% and produced capital by over 10%. We then have the factor input shares in GDP. So the 0.59 uh, for labor and the 
residual is 0.41 for capital. So we multiply the factor input shares by the growth rates of average annual growth rates of the inputs, and that gives us the contribution to GDP per worker growth. So the 1% growth in human capital uh, times the 0.59 labor share translates to an 0.6% contribution. Produced capital uh, contributed 4.2%. So subtracting 0.6 and 4.2 from 6.1 gives us then productivity growth of 1.3%. So in that, that is in a nutshell how to do growth accounting. And given that, given these outcomes, you can indeed see here that uh, that growth in China over this period relied to a substantial degree on growth of inputs. Um, so it was certainly uh, also extensive growth. Uh, at the same time, we see productivity growing by 1.3% over this 20-year period. Um, which is comparable to, say, the growth rate of, uh, of Korea, South Korea from uh, the 1960s to the early 1990s. So um, it's also not the case that uh, growth in China comes at the ex is, is purely a matter of uh, a lot of capital being invested. Uh, there's also uh, shifts of the production function. So to wrap this up, uh, the central question that I started off with is what are the sources and prospects for economic growth and how to uh, learn more about this. Uh, and to learn more about this, we need a model for growth of economic growth and we need data on output and inputs to implement this model. And doing these together will then uh, give you growth accounting results. Uh, and answers to the uh, that help answer the these the central questions.